pair of killings would become known as the double event. The double killing is believed to have occurred because he was so psyched up after the, uh, the first killing, he'd had not uh, time to complete what he'd wanted to do. Police were certain the Ripper had committed both crimes because of their proximity and an eyewitness, Israel Schwartz. He saw them fight and he saw her. the guy hit Liz Stride and she fell to the floor with a scream. And then 15, 20 minutes later, she's found dead. From, from my point of view and from most people's point of view, that's important because if you think it's possible that Liz Stride was attacked by two people that night within 15 minutes of each other, the chances of that may be a little remote. In addition to an eyewitness, the police found something more. The Ripper this time left what is probably the only clue he ever really did leave. A couple of blocks to the east of Mitre Square, he threw a piece of blood-stained apron into the doorway of numbers 108 to 119 Galston Street. This was Edo's apron, so it was definitely thrown down by the killer. Above this piece of apron, on the uh, jam of the door, was written a message in chalk. The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Now, many argue that this was written by the killer. And there was, again, an upsurge of anti-Semitic feeling. And it, to such an extent that the chief rabbi in London at the time had said to all Jewish people, this is a time that we must play a low profile. I don't, we don't really want anything brought to attention for people to seize on Jews being the, the cause for this. The anti-Semitic climate in the community led Commissioner Warren to make a questionable investigative decision. Detectives were stationed by this doorway so that a photograph could be taken of the message once it was daylight. But now the incredible happens. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner, ex-army man Sir Charles Warren, orders the message to be rubbed from the wall without any photographs being taken of it. When the detectives protest and ask why, well, says Warren, there are lots of Jews living in this area. This could be an incitement to race riots. Well, I think the erasing is a move of mammoth stupidity, considering that they did have cameras at the time and they could have, you know, they... They could have photographed it if it was relevant and I suppose out of its erasing has arrived the great conspiracy theories. I think I rather agree with some other commentators uh, of the time or later that there was massive amounts of graffiti about so it may mean absolutely nothing. Uh, as for the, the piece of apron, the only real benefit that that has to us, that the only real clue that it provided is that it shows the direction that the Ripper left when he, he left from Mitre Square. It shows that Jack the Ripper was heading back into the East End of London. He wasn't heading into the wealthier city. And that's really the only clue that the apron provides us. It shows us the way that the Ripper was moving and, and the probability of where he was living or, or at least where he was trying to make his escape to. Police surgeon Dr Frederick Gordon Brown performed the autopsy on Catherine Eddowes. The peritoneal lining was cut through on the left side and the left kidney carefully taken out and removed. To have removed the kidney and to know where it was placed, such a knowledge might be possessed by someone in the habit of cutting up animals. Brown's report revived theories that the Ripper was a doctor, a tradesman skilled with a knife, or a madman experienced in anatomy. Missing from Edo's body was not only her kidney, but, like Chapman, her womb. In the wake of these four horrific murders, all of London shuddered, wondering not if, but when the killer would strike again. By October 1888, the police had launched an all-out search for Whitechapel's elusive serial killer. Following the double event, police patrols in the area increased dramatically with undercover detectives, some disguised as women working the docks. Police also posted warnings for women to stay off the streets. But for the East End's prostitutes, this was hardly an option. For the women who kept going out on the streets for those casual prostitutes, life was already a gamble. They were living on the margins economically. That gamble 
just got harder and the stakes just got much more drastic. They were on the streets all night long, right through the murders. Um, desperation, lack of money, they had to be on the streets trying to earn a living and some of them were so hopeless that they said, well, that, you know, they'd rather fall victim to Jack the Ripper than to have to jump off a bridge and commit suicide. The murders are concentrated in a very, very tiny area and there was an absolute terror in the uh, Whitechapel and the surrounding districts. You have this enormous petition uh, put up from the women of Child Whitechapel, 40,000 women petitioning Queen Victoria, you know, sort of to get something done about, uh, uh, about, uh, about the murders. The Queen responded to the petition by contacting the police authorities and writing a letter to the Prime Minister. This new, most ghastly murder shows the absolute necessity for some very decided action. All these courts must be lit and our detectives improve. They are not what they should be. So as we went through this, it's, it became very, very serious very early on. As probably you know to a certain extent that questions were being asked in Parliament and Queen Victoria got involved, the, the, the monarch at the time, and was asking questions and governments nearly, a government nearly fell on this. In a last-ditch effort to counter mounting criticism, the police consented to using bloodhounds in the investigation. Commissioner Warren volunteered to play the fugitive during a test manhunt in Hyde Park. Unfortunately, the dogs were unable to follow his scent, and the failure heightened the public's ridicule. Then, on October the 16th, the gruesome case took a ghoulish turn. George Lusk of Whitechapel's Mile End Vigilance Committee received a small parcel in the mail. Inside it, a piece of human kidney and a letter addressed from hell. Mr. Lusk, sir, I send you off the kidney I took from one, preserved it for you. T'other piece I fraud and ate. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out, if you only wait a while longer. Catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. There was no certainty the kidney came from Catherine Eddowes' body. The newspapers reported that a doctor of pathology at London Hospital confirmed it came from a 45-year-old woman who suffered from Bright's disease, a condition brought on by alcoholism. The pathologist's description of the remaining kidney in Eddowes' body was that it was pale, bloodless and congested at the pyramids, which in fact was a sign of Bright's disease, but that's the only indication that it may have existed. And Bright's disease was quite common, so... I don't think too much can be read into that at all. There's a lot of argument about it, but uh, the general consensus seems to be that, yes, the piece of kidney was gen genuine, she suffered from Bright's disease, and the piece of this piece of kidney matched up with the fragment inside Catherine Eddowes. So if you accept the kidney is genuine, you have to accept the letter is genuine, and if you accept the letter is genuine, then the letter is unsigned. There is no name of Jack the Ripper. So possibly, presumably, the murderer was rejecting uh, that identity that was being put on him by the papers. Experts then and now have debated which of the letters, if any, is authentic. But they do agree on one thing. Searching for a killer who targets random strangers is a daunting investigative challenge, even today. We're very fortunate. I, this is why the police officers in those days had a far harder job than police officers today. We have got professionals to help us. We can go, you know, to the FBI or have our own people do offender profiling and come up with a profile of what the guy will look like and how he will act, etc, etc. During the late 1880s, in the wake of Darwin's theory of evolution, criminology linked human behaviour to biological factors. Distinctive physical traits and facial features were believed to reveal criminal types who were seen as more ape-like creatures not as fully developed as most humans. Research into this area probably did little more than reinforce prevailing ethnic stereotypes and prejudices. And it likely had the police and the public looking for the wrong man. In fact, what might have served the Ripper best was a deceptively ordinary appearance, one that would not draw attention during a time of great fear and suspicion. 